We now have time for questions. In the interest of time, we will join a few questions and probably have two to three rounds, depending on, on how fast things go. So, Could I ask, Jonathan Hopkins, to what extent the results of your research are having an impact on the sort of policy proposals that the IRS is when it's setting out conditions for them in the countries? We're taking me. a bunch we of questions, I take it? We have a little problem for reasons of taping this. It would be nice if you could repeat the question into the microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but... I asked Mr. Ostry uh, to what extent the results of his research are having an impact on IMF policy making. Please hear. I do have also a question to the last speaker. My question is a very, very uh, quick one. Can you say something about the difference if you distinguish between the OECD or the industrialized countries and the, le the less devel developed countries? In particular, if you do have completely different results or stronger results if you only look to the industrialized countries? Thank you. Right in front, Hans Jörg. Um, Hans Jörg here. I have also a question to Mr. Ostre. The, the, um, my first question is. Uh, what kind of economic model do you follow? It seems to be a completely supply side model, and it, it feels, uh, it sounds for me very, very strange to speak about inequality and not even mention demand. So, my question is what, what do you think? What is the relationship between inequality and demand, and how is it discussed in the International Monetary Fund? Is there any uh, debate about that, that demand might be important for the short and the long run? The second question is, the, mm, May this question may be a little bit unfair, but I just want to uh, have your opinion. I, if you make this empirical analysis, analysis and, and have, let's say, 140 countries or whatever number, uh, what is the justification to pool all these countries? You, these countries may, may live under completely different regimes and might not be justified to, to just to, to take this great number of countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, right behind you. Thanks. I've got uh, one quick one for Steve and then uh, a long, little bit longer for, for he and for Till. Uh, Steve, you, you weren't really clear on whether housing is in your new measures for consumption in that last work you're doing. Um, but more, more to the essence of it, your inequality discussion, when you do the 5 and 95, uh, dis, uh, I think it needs some more granularity because there's so many possible things that are going on um, in that 95% that can be quite different by segments. And of course, I, you know, we think of work that would look at different gender and race effects and regional effects, et cetera. And I, I fear that it, we will end up not being really clear whether we're talking about the middle class when we talk about the bottom 95%, a huge mistake of the Obama administration, and something that invited Till in his presentation to use the discussion about, um, uh, what was it, aspirational consumption as an overall trigger and discussion for a motivation for many people. But we need to know which people. I think it's important to make maybe finer, more granular distinctions in this research, which is fascinating. Thank you. Um, there's a question here at the front, and then we'll take one last one at the back. Um, sorry, I have a question for um, um, Till von Track. Um, the first question was only um, um, you talk about um, export driven, um, um, export led um, growth in countries like Germany, maybe, and um, in Anglo Saxon countries like US, um, more uh, debt driven consumption growth. And do you call this as functional income distribution? I I would say this. I would. I would think so. And I want to ask um, more. Um, can you get a closer view why it comes to these different roles? What is the. What is the. What is the. What is the reason for this 
um, different types of um, schemes. Okay, there was one at the back. Uh, this question is for Till. Um, I, at the very end of your uh, of your presentation, you had your very last bullet. You said that you thought that models, uh, macro models, should include uh, both the functional and the personal income distribution. And I was curious to hear more about that, or who you thought was doing interesting work in that area, both on the theoretical, but also on the empirical side. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to the podium for now, and we'll have a second round. Um, so should we start? in the order of, of presentation, if you're ready. Uh, okay, thanks uh, a lot for these uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> Gary Dimsky talked about aspirational consumption and uh, that it was important to know who was really engaging in uh, these, uh, this kind of aspirational consumption. Um, so here I think the the new paper, which I also uh, by by Emmanuel says and Gabriel Zuckmann that I discovered uh, only recently, is very interesting because it shows um, that actually it was the uh, nine percentiles just below the top one percent of the wealth distribution that have strongly lowered their saving rates, and um, I think this is really key to understanding the um, trends in the aggregate saving rate because. Uh, in other countries, including Germany, we also observe that people at the very bottom of the distribution have also lowered their saving rate, probably because their real incomes have gone down and they try to maintain a certain standard of living. But in macroeconomic terms, it doesn't really matter what the bottom half of the population does in terms of uh, saving behavior because they uh, have uh, very little income. So if you observe um, a decline in the aggregate uh, household saving rate by uh, eight or ten percentage uh, points, then this really must be driven by um, the consumption behavior of the middle class or even of the upper middle class. And I think this is perfectly consistent with the aspirational consumption model or as uh, Robert Frank uh, puts it, the expenditure cascades model, because it was precisely the percentiles between the 90th and 99th percentile uh, who have uh, seen uh, the strongest decline in, the, in relative incomes, because most of the increase in incomes went to the top 1%, those who really suffered, as I said, a decrease in, in their relative income were just with those income groups just below. And I think this is a very important to, to understand and to distinguish from, from other countries. Um, then there was this question, how do uh, the expert-led models versus the debt led models uh, emerge. So, I mean, as I tried to, uh, to explain, uh, in, in my view, in the US, and but also in the UK, other Anglo-Saxon countries, there were really these expenditure cascades uh, going on, and the very strong rise in incomes for the top 1%, or, or let's say the top 5%, put pressure on everybody um, below in the income scale to uh, actually reduce their saving, go into debt in order to keep up with the higher uh, spending of the top 1% uh, or top 5%. Um, especially because in the Anglo-Saxon countries, um, you have to pay privately for education, for housing, for healthcare, and so on. And so um, this only reinforces this pressure to, to try and keep up with the, um, with the uh, spending norms that are set really by, um, by the top uh, of the income distribution. Whereas in Germany, the top uh, income households, they, they really didn't uh, uh, increase their consumption so much, so the pr pressure that was put on uh, the middle class or the upper middle class which was much weaker. And also we have a better provision of public goods in Germany and so on, and therefore there was also less need for the middle class to engage in these um, um, debt financed uh, um, expenditure cascades. And therefore uh, the stagnation of, of uh, real mass incomes in Germany didn't lead to expenditure cascades and debt led consumption, but they led to um, um, a restraint in consumption demand, a restraint in domestic demand, and thereby uh, an excessive dependence on, on net, net exports. So, uh, and, and, and this is linked to the fact that um, the, the, the main shift in income distribution in Germany was not uh, in a top-end personal inequality, but it was in the distribution between the corporate sector 
and, um, and the, the household sector. Uh, the corporate sector is accumulating um, um, uh, retained earnings within the firms, and this, these, in my view, excessive profits, they are not spent, and thereby they restrain uh, uh, domestic demand. Um, and so this leads me to the last uh, question, I think, that was um, addressed to me, the link between personal and functional income distribution. Um, well, while I have given the, I hope, uh, the intuition why I think it's important to combine um, the functional and personal distribution in models, we have actually also uh, uh, done some modest effort to uh, <laughs> to to uh, to do what we are preaching. Uh, so we have um, built a pretty uh, large-scale uh, so-called stock flow consistent model in which there are three countries, and in each of the three countries, there is the distribution between the corporate sector and the household sector, and um, the household sector is in turn um, separated into two income deciles. And so in our model, it is very um, important to know where exactly in the income, personal income distribution scale uh, the shock to income inequality occurs. If the shock occurs at the very top of the distribution, then the expenditure cascades will be much stronger because um, those people in the upper middle class just below the top of the distribution, they will lower their saving rate and they will uh, increase uh, consumption and go into debt. This is exactly what happened in the US. Whereas if the shock in the income distribution occurs in the lower bottom uh, of the distribution, then yes, uh, 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 poor people will reduce their saving, they will, their leverage ratio will increase, but the macroeconomic effect is uh, near zero because um, in, in the bottom half of the, uh, the distribution, distribution, uh, there is hardly any income. And so the weight in the aggregate saving rate is very small. So, uh, and, and in this model, we, we therefore try to, um, to, um, to calibrate the model to, to the data while looking at functional and, um, and personal um, uh, distribution. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about the model in detail because even when I'm basically reading my presentation, I can still make many, I mean, less, fewer words than, than Steve when, when he's talking freely. So uh, uh, I, didn't have, I just didn't have time to talk about, about this model. Well, that may well be true, but uh, you, you haven't heard me speak in German. <laughs> so I always find it pretty amazing that people can give professional presentations in their non-native non language. Not, that's something I've never had to do and probably never will. Uh, so uh, let me just answer, answer Gary's questions. Uh, first, the basic clarification question in terms of the adjusted demand measure. Uh, yes, it does include housing. The, the trick here gives me a chance to just expand on that slightly. The, the, the trick here is that it doesn't double count housing. So you know, the, the uh, simple thing I did early in the crisis was saying, OK, I have personal consumption expenditure dropped, and I have residential construction. That obviously is more or less something being driven for the household sector. It dropped a lot, too. Let's just add the two together, and you see much bigger drops. Uh, but it, it, it came to learn that's actually inconsistent, because there is this imputation of housing in the personal consumption already. So basically, a simple, simple story is take out all the things having to do with imputed owner's equivalent rent put in residential construction. Now, if you want to read the, if you read the paper, you'll see there's actually a lot of subtlety to that. I know way, way more about the, the deep uh, uh, tables of housing imputations and the national income and project counts than I ever thought possible uh, by, by this point. It's, it's much more complex than it seems. But, uh, but that's basically what happens and, and generates a big part of that, but not all of it. There are other parts of it, too. In terms of the more substantive question about uh, about a finer grain in the analysis, I fully agree. But let me be clear about how this, how this is working and what you saw. This is not a bottom-up kind of analysis where we have a large micro data set and kind of build up to, the, to, to these groups. It's the top-down. We're decomposing the aggregate. And in the instruments of time, I shouldn't go into much more detail. But as a result, we're quite limited in what we can do. In particular, uh, especially given my new foray into sociology, uh, focusing on the stratification by race, by gender, by other kinds of things is simply not possible with this kind of data. I'll comment on that in a minute. In terms of different income groupings, though, we've, we've done a little bit of that, as I suggested with my final slide. One, one thing we did look at quite early in the process was the rise in the debt income ratio from the survey of consumer finance cut a lot of different ways, because there we actually did have the underlying micro data and could do these kinds of things. And it was really quite striking. Part of the reason of uh, focusing on 5 and 95 uh, was that the, uh, 
the debt to income ratio was basically rising at more or less the same slope every place uh, outside of the bottom 20, it rose faster there, but of course very low incomes, uh, and the top five, which was basically flat. And so from the 20th percentile to the 95th percentile, they're all borrowing more in some respects. Uh, now, in terms of the actual decomposition of the consumption stuff, that was more limited by the, the, by the source data we had, but we could look a little bit more on that. And I showed you the, that last little piece with the bottom 80 share and the top 5 share. And actually, there the results look somewhat like what Till just described, because what we effectively did was get a middle group, which would have been the 80th to the 95th percentile. Did they look more like the people at the top, or did they look like the, the people below them? And the answer is the second. They look more like the people below them. They were, they were consuming more, and actually their drop in the recession, when the, when the borrowing was cut off, if anything, was more severe than, than the, the bottom 95 as a whole. So it seems like a lot of this action is actually this, this upper middle class group to some extent, uh, you know, which is interesting in itself. And of course, I agree with Till that, and this is part of the reason I make the point about so many other dimensions of inequality, like social justice uh, and, and, and democracy and other kinds of things, because if you're looking macroeconomics, you know, you, the, the issue with the bottom part of the income distribution is they don't have very much money, and so they can't have that much weight in these macroeconomic kind of calculations. One last quick comment, though, is that in, a, in addition, and new work we're doing, Barry and I are firing up the personal uh, the, the panel study of income dynamics, which has so many issues, but we'll have actually a true bottom-up data set, and so at some future conference here, I hope to share results where we could do more of this kind of thing. Okay. Um, well, I... I uh I share the uh, war stories about having to present in, in your non-native language. I, I consider myself to be bilingual, but my first mission at the fund was to France. And uh, although I, I speak French fluently, I wrote a paper on financial deregulation and the French saving rate. And after I arrived to Paris, my mission chief told me, you know that the consultation is in French. And I said, yeah. He said, it means you're presenting this paper in French. So um, it is a big challenge, even if you consider yourself to be bilingual, to, uh, to do a technical presentation in, in another language. Anyway, um, let, me, uh, let me briefly say uh, a few things about the excellent questions. Um, there was, a, there was a, a general question about how has this uh, uh, how has this work informed uh, the fund's approach to countries? Now, uh, I, I think we have to get real here for a minute. Um, uh, a bunch of regressions are not going to inform the fund or uh, what a country does, nor should they. Um, what we hope regressions will do is they will um, they will be, uh, you know, input into uh, the debates that people are having. Um, uh, and uh, I think these uh, regressions, for whatever they're worth, have been, uh, uh, you know, have, have been an input into the debates. Um, uh, they, they have gotten uh, a lot of play. I think that has to do with the times we're in where, uh, where inequality is very hot. But there is going to be more that is needed to inform policy on the ground than uh, the, this work. I think it's, it's important work, and I think it's work that's, that's informing the debate, but it's, it's not the end of the story. Um, uh, I would say, you know, in terms of the knee-jerk reaction that the evil IMF um, uh, doesn't pay attention to the poor or to social safety nets or to health care spending, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that view. I think the, the serious work that's been done looking at uh, uh, certainly recent lending programs uh, shows quite clearly that the fund uh, pays a lot of attention uh, to these issues, to health spending, to social safety nets. I think the work we did on fiscal multipliers uh, was very salient in terms of um, uh, showing the dangers of excessive austerity. So, so um, I'm, not, I'm not an apologist for, the, for those uh, kinds of views. Um, uh, there was a question about OECD versus non-OECD. Um, I mean, a, a few things on this. Um, uh, the, the results uh, are presented throughout the paper pretty much 
OECD and non-OECD and full sample. Um, uh, and, you know, the results basically hold for both groups. But I think there is an important uh, uh, point to emphasize here, which is uh, just because Germany can, uh, or the United States or the United Kingdom may be able to do um, substantive redistribution without uh, large adverse effects on growth doesn't mean uh, Benin, Zambia, or uh, some other developing country can do the same thing. The, the quality of fiscal institutions is obviously very important. So I think that that's, that's an important element uh, in you know, how you would want to uh, apply these results in different, con in different country situations and whether, you, you know, whether the result that redistribution has no adverse effects on growth passes the smell test. I think it may pass the smell test for relatively rich countries with good quality uh, institutions. It's more doubtful to me that it passes the test for, for other countries. So again, you know, what, what holds for the average may not hold for everybody. Um, you know, inequality and demand, uh, no, I didn't talk about demand or supply, but there, there was a, a slide that went through the literature and some of the theories are about demand and some of them are about supply. And I have, I, I found very interesting the two presentations that, that came before me that talked about demand. I, 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 have, uh, I have no problem uh, with, with those theories. I think they're, they're very, very relevant. Um, uh, and, you know, um, uh, the, 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 there was a general question, um, you know, uh, about homogeneity of our of our sample and the lack thereof, um, and, and so that comes a bit to the OECD non OECD. It, it, it also comes to something that we we spent a lot of time in in, in the previous paper, which is you want to tie in these empirical results to the narratives uh, on the ground, and so what we did is we did a number of case studies. Uh, drawing on historical narratives, not economic narratives, to see uh, the role of uh, inequality in, uh, in imperiling the sustainability of growth. And, and, and we were comforted that, in, uh, you know, in a lot of the perspectives from political scientists and historians, this was indeed a key player. Thanks a lot. Uh, we now have time for a second quick round of questions. Please here in the front. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I have one question for Till. Um, I'm not sure if I misinterpreted what was on his slide or what you said, but at one point you said that the increase in top income earners stabilized wages. Did you say that? I don't understand the mechanism, so I would please like if you can elaborate on that. And then to Stephen, um, okay, I'm not really convinced that you portray the period from the 1980s until the crisis in the U.S. as the consumer age. I think it's kind of important to complement it with neoliberalism because I think by explaining it only through the lenses of the consumer age places emphasis on the role of consumption but not so much on the role of the political and economic agenda of neoliberalism characterized by privatization and deregulation which led to uh, a substantial fall in the wage share and this was a key driver of the increased debt to maintain the consumption. And um, also the emphasis on consumption ignores the role of investment demand. And uh, this is very important, especially from a post-Keynesian perspective, and especially in the age of financialization, where firms are substituting investment demand for uh, investment in financial assets. So, uh, yeah, and then by extension, when they're not in, uh, conducting real investment, then there's less employment, and so the cycle continues. And then um, I also, at the end, you said um, then recovery depends on the consumption of the affluent, which I'm also not convinced because they have a much lower marginal propensity to consume. And even with quantitative easing, which directly transfers income to them because they are owning the majority of the assets in the banks, there is no real effect on growth. It's staying the same. So I, I, don't, I don't, yeah, I would like to know more on that. Thank you. And one more. <laughs> 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 
for um, R3. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but uh, what is extreme redistribution? Because you say that's bad for good, but what is that? Thank you. Thanks. Um, we had a question on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> Andreas Botsch, German Trade Union Confederation. Uh, two quick points. Uh, one is a question to uh, everybody on the panel. Uh, uh, can we safely uh, conclude from, from your presentations that uh, the less unequal uh, we grow, uh, the less growth we need to achieve the same welfare effects? Uh, is that uh, is that one uh, possible conclusion of uh, of your presentations? Second point is a question to Till. Um, I think it's very important that you distinguish between stocks and flows of inequality, and um, uh, the uh, there may be effects on uh, the stocks on uh, of the stocks on flows uh, if you you know look at net financial wealth, uh, take Germany, we can use, you know, EU or EMU, whatever, uh, take Germany uh, and, you know, um, uh, take that uh, there is something just slightly over six trillion of net financial uh, assets for Germany. Uh, that's roughly two times, it's a bit more than two times uh, GDP. Uh, and uh, take that uh, this net these net financial assets uh, you know require a very modest uh, return uh, very modest uh, interest uh, say two percent nominal uh, that still means that uh, in terms of accounting equivalencies you need uh, you know 120 billion uh, euros a year just to satisfy that extremely modest uh, uh, request uh, for, for, for interest. Now, that would mean uh, that the wage share will continue to fall unless a certain amount of nominal growth in Germany is achieved. In that case, it would be 4.5% uh, in nominal terms. Uh, and if that's not achieved, and in the absence of any you know, wealth levy or wealth taxation, uh, the, the, the wage share will continue to fall. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions in the interest of time. If you um, please keep your questions very brief. Uh, one here. Um, very briefly to the last speaker about causality. What if, if, what if investment drives growth and growth determines equality or inequality. So what if the causality is just the other way around? Thank you. <laughs> and one here. Uh, one is for Austri. Uh, I in, l learned that uh, there is a big difference in results of distribution, of gene distribution, before and after taxes. That for instance, in the United States, in Sweden, before tax, they are not very different. Uh, and they are fully different after. Could you give some more information about that? And about Fazari. Uh, and you, you the, the both post Keynesians. Uh, I have the impression that you, that, uh, you give too much, we, macroeconomists, give too much importance to distribution in macroeconomics. Uh, that distribution is much better made through uh, minimum wage and uh, taxes, and not by uh, spot-led, profit-led, wage-led. Thank you. I will now give back to the, to the podium and ask for answering of the questions and any final statements you might to, to add. Um, let's go in reverse order maybe now and, and start with Mr. Ostri, if that's okay. Okay, um, I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, some uh, the lady asked, um, "What's what's the definition of extreme redistribution?" It's the top top quartile, so that that's uh, that's what it means. Um, reverse causality. That's a very important uh, question, um, uh, and one I didn't get uh, uh, time to talk about. Um, uh, basically, our approach is is SGMM. So, uh, for those of you who like SGMM uh, as a technique. 
uh, fine. Uh, for those of you who do not, uh, you will have questions. Um, I, I would say that um, it's it, it sort of more as a, as a heuristic thing. The literature uh, that uh, essentially argues that growth is good for the poor, uh, as, you know, really um, the empirical regularity that they uh, have uncovered, this is the bank, uh, the World Bank uh, in a series of papers, is that um, uh, growth uh, does not materially affect uh, the genie. So if you are um, thinking that the reverse causality is what uh, lies behind our results, um, I, I don't see a lot of papers suggesting uh, uh, uncovering an empirical regularity that economic growth um, uh, has a discernible effect one way or the other uh, on the genie. My stylized fact is a growing pie uh, and, uh, and uh, the same sized uh, relative shares of everybody. That's the, uh, the AER papers on growth or good for the poor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the question on, uh, but, but, but again, we, we have tried our best with SGMM. Uh, the fact that there really aren't uh, 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 good external instruments that one could bring to bear on this question, so one is relying on internal in instruments, which is what SGMM does. I think, uh, I think that is, uh, have been, has been our approach. Um, uh, Sweden versus USA, uh, pre and uh, post tax. Uh, uh, genies. Indeed, that is the that is the theme of our paper uh, to basically use the SWID data to look at differences between uh, market and uh, net inequality, and then to calculate the difference between those two. So, indeed, Sweden is uh, is an archetypal example of one type, and the U.S. of another. So. Okay, so. Uh Got a few challenges here about the consumer age. I've gotten various ones over the time. These are a little bit different. Uh, so let me just you know, very briefly respond to several of the points that were made. One is the idea of this consumer age or consumption expenditure versus neoliberalism. This is exactly the point that I was trying to mention in the, in the presentation, but let me emphasize it again, which is it's not, in my view, an either or thing. That ne the, as I mentioned, the, the way this consumer age process works as creating a, a, a unique, effective for two decades, but ultimately unsustainable demand generation process is because of the access to credit that the household sector had, to the extent that that came to some extent from, neoliberal, uh, from the neoliberal policies, from financialization, the deregulation of, uh, of lending, then it's, it's, it's right there. It's not the emphasis of this presentation, fair enough. Maybe I could give it more emphasis. But these are, I, I don't see them as competing. I think they're complementary in terms of what went on. If, if the, in terms of investment demand, that is something I paid some attention to, as most people in the room know, over, over my career. And, uh, you know, investment was, uh, over, over this same period, was sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker. You had a big boom in the late 90s of investment. Uh, but actually, to the extent that this kind of financialization argument says there's less, you know, less of the corporate income being recycled back to investment, it is the case that the cash flow effects that I built much of my career on are weaker in the later part of the period than they were in the estimation period that some of my earlier work was based on. Then, in a sense, it just that all actually magnifies the consumer age aspect because at least in the U.S. context, between uh, up until the Great Recession, we had reasonably strong economic growth despite the fact that investment was, you know, weak uh, in, not entirely, but in various periods there. So, uh, you know, we could talk more about that. And um, let's see, I guess that's, oh, oh and I, I, should, I should comment on the point about the affluent, my comment about the affluent. I didn't say this was a good thing. Uh, I said this is, this is, this is the data, uh, such as you believe our techniques for, for uh, doing these kinds of things, that because of the way that the, these trends are evolving over time, a, a larger and larger, substantially larger share of consumption demand is taking place uh, it's being driven by the higher part of the income distribution. Uh, I agree that the, it, I think it's, it's, it's the issue fundamentally that the propensity to consume, and as I mentioned, the marginal tax rates are higher in this group. And that's part of the reason why we still have this big gap. Uh, you know, ultimately there's a gap, but there is some growth being generated. Uh, if that might be surprising to you, it's the fact that, that, that so much of the demand is being generated by the top. I certainly don't think it's a good thing. That's why the title of that, supply, uh, that slide was, you know, is this democracy? I, my, my answer would be no, but it is, it is at least in the U.S. reality. Uh, 
let me just comment a bit about to Luis's comment about uh, uh, too much importance to macro, basically referring to the wage, uh, wage profit-led growth debate versus things like the minimum wage, tax rate di distribution, and things like that. I guess I wouldn't put it as too much emphasis on macro. I, mean, what I see what I'm doing is macro and working there. But and in some sense, and then I can pass this on to Till, uh, the, uh, it, it's really a focus moving away from the functional distribution of income, wages versus profits, to the personal in uh, distribution of income, uh, which is you know, something that you saw reflected in this, in this panel. And so if you go to policy for the kinds of issues I'm talking about, those policies would be related to things that would you know, help, uh, you know, help in the personal distribution of income, uh, stronger minimum wages, living wages, uh, various kinds of indexation, uh, tax, uh, tax redistribution up to a point, which certainly relates to what Jonathan was talking about. The issue there is, is though, is to the extent we have rising inequality, you would have to have rising tax redistribution so it could shift the level, but maybe, maybe has some problems for the growth rate. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite get the question about less unequal versus uh, needing less growth. In, 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 in some respects, the, the idea here, at least the positive implication of this, is that if we have rising inequality, there may be these, these historical reasons why the effects of that don't happen immediately, but in the end, uh, the, the rising in, income inequality will compromise demand growth in this intrins, intrinsic Keynesian perspective. Okay, on the first uh, question, I'm glad that you didn't uh, misunderstand uh, me. I did say that uh, the rise in top incomes in the U.S. or also in other Anglo-Saxon countries somewhat paradoxically stabilized the weight share. And um, actually, the reason, the simple reason is that um, management pay, so top management pay, uh, is uh, counted as wages in the national accounts. And therefore, the wage share, say, in the US, uh, didn't fall as much as in Germany. And so that's why I also would emphasize the need to look at these different measures of uh, um, income distribution. You have to look at the wage share. You can look at the Gini coefficient, although I would tend to think that this is the least perhaps useful uh, measure. And you should look at top income shares. And there have been some funny debates uh, going on. So for example, in Germany, many uh, economists, but also non-economists, they keep complaining about the fall of the wage share. And then they look um, around uh, to different countries and they are saying, well, look, even in the United States, you know, uh, the wage share hasn't fallen that much and wages have developed more. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, than, than in Germany, but then when you take out the top 1% uh, of wages uh, uh, in the U.S., the fall in the wage share is, is very similar to that uh, uh, in Germany. Um, and so uh, that's why I think it is very uh, important to look at both functional distribution. I think maybe Steve is going a bit too far when he advocates uh, a complete, sh I mean, uh, you're not saying that, but. Uh, don't, don't put that one on me, not in this audience in particular. Not a complete shift. <laughs> I agree with Steve that there should not be a complete shift. Uh, <laughs> in the focus of attention away from functional distribution from personal distribution, but I would just argue that it, it is very important to look at, at, at both. And my preferred measures would be um, weight share and especially um, uh, the share of uh, um, corporate disposable income in, 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 in private income and, and top household income shares. So full agreement uh, uh, with Steve. Um, on the second question, I, I understood uh, Andreas um, uh, uh, in the following way. Uh, you were suggesting that maybe in, an, in a society that is more equal, uh, we need less growth. So there, there is a, a a, a, a lower need, a lesser need for growth in, in, a, in an equal society. And I would fully agree with that um, because actually this idea of expenditure cascades and aspirational consumption um, um, can also be applied to the labor supply because um, there are basically three options for households um, that see a decline in their relative incomes to keep up with the uh, spending of, um, of richer households. And the first is they can uh, reduce their saving. Uh, the second one is they can um, increasingly go into debt. And the third thing is they can increase their labor supply, so work more hours in order to have an higher, uh, a higher income. And, um, and so uh, I, would, I would agree or, or I would argue that a more equal society um, is a society where um, say um, the, the reduction of working hours uh, 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 will be 
much more easily accepted by, um, by the population than a very unequal society, because in an unequal society, there is always the illusion that by working hard, one can um, improve one's relative status, um, uh, uh, I mean, relative to others. And so um, that would be, uh, I think, the main mechanism that I, that I see uh, going from an equal society to a lesser uh, need for growth. And then uh, your second question, I think I don't have to say much uh, on this because you just gave a perfect uh, summary of this uh, small little model by uh, Piketty where he emphasizes precisely the importance to look at this uh, simple stock flow relationship, um, which he calls beta, which is the wealth to income ratio. And um, depending on some para parameters in, in the model, like the rate of return on capital, the nominal growth rate, and what I would emphasize, the gap between the saving rates of high-income households and low-income households, um, you can figure out uh, if there will be an infinite rise uh, in um, both the functional and the personal um, uh, um, uh, income inequality. And, um, and, and so basically I agree with, with everything you said. Um, and on the last uh, uh, question, uh, well, I must admit that me too, uh, I, I feel sometimes somewhat confused when there is this debate over whether this particular country is wage-led or profit-led. And what I try to emphasize is that a country like Germany may, may well be uh, wage-led because um, the fall in the wage share has restrained domestic demand and so we ended up with this economy which is completely dependent on exports. But I find it much more difficult to say whether a country like the US uh, uh, is wage-led or profit-led because I think here much of the, most of the music really comes from, from the personal um, um, uh, income distribution. So uh, uh, again, uh, the, um, the, the plead would, the final word, the plead would be uh, uh, to look at uh, uh, both the functional distribution and the personal uh, distribution.